buffer. Uh, the probability change, you don't have any more complete transition on the behavior. And behavior. And well, basically, there is some hysteresis. I don't go too much into details because I want to focus on the simulation. So these are the experimental part. And so when they came to us, they told us, listen, there is a problem. The, um, we don't understand what's going on in the system. Can we do some simulation? So that's what we do. So this is another nice story about how we do DFT simulation and how often they do not work out. So the first thing to do is to have a model. So to create a crystallographic structure where we can calculate the property. Unfortunately, the systems are very disordered, are very flexible. It's not easy to have a specific structure. So you have partial occupancy, you have disorder, you have tilting, you have different phases. And so first of all, we have to decide to make some approximation for our model, to decide what was a water molecule, what was an OH group, because that's not distinguishable in uh, X-ray scattering, you have to go neutral. And, and then we have to study different uh, magnetic configurations. So we have done so. Uh, we made a simple model, which is nice uh, symmetry, inversion center. When we start to play around with the properties, uh, this is just to prove that our system has a specific symmetry, and this is the comparison between the theoretical uh, X-ray diffraction pattern and the experimental one. Um, now, a bit. So, one problem when you calculate, cal uh, you calculate magnetic properties that depends highly on or basically on F electrons, C electrons. They are very correlated. And this is the small amount of quantity that DFT is not very good at doing. So you need many different uh, approaches here. So you can do some dirt and quick TGA, so basically some gradient. Uh, so first order derivative approximation to this interaction is cheap, doesn't work well. Some people take this value that put some extra parameter, Hubble curve, to put the levels in the right position. Uh, a bit better, and still cheap. Other people do other calculation, which means they use some experimental data to improve the quality of the details. So we try to do, we went down this line, we try to reproduce the system. We know the system is probably insulated, so the first thing we tried to do was to obtain the bank of the system. Um, this is more technical, we can skip this. So whenever we did the simulation of the bank structure, we always found uh, some metallic system. So this line here, this is the density state. This is the, is the position of the bands. It's the, if you want, is the energy of the orbitals. And this line uh, divides the orbitals that are empty from the orbitals that are full. Right? So because here you have a, an orbital band that is partially full, it means that that material is metallic. You need a small um, energy, for example, light or even temperature to make that conductive. And this doesn't reproduce the experimental evidence. So we include a plus U correction term. So we see we open the band gap in one of the spin channels, but we're not unable to open the band gap in the other one. So which means that the level, the energetic level of the electron is basically off. So we try a different U method. And as you can see, we open the band gap but in the wrong position, so it didn't work out very well. So at the end, the only way we managed to do that was to use an added method plus the correction of the plus U model. So basically we say we did we use some experimental values plus some magic number, let's say, to open the band gap and we could actually finally reproduce the uh, electronic band structure. So you can see here, for example, for copper, we can see there is a different, uh, this is very close to name, uh, there is an imbalance between uh, plus or up electrons and down electrons. And that was able for us to create a magnetic model and then we start to work on larger scale simulation. So <coughs> this was mostly an example to show you that even if T you can't really take a structure to that in a software running and hoping something goes up. You need to go in the physics of the interaction you are interested in, in the technical details of, of what you're doing, and then you always have to keep an eye on what the experiment is telling you because you want to reproduce the experiment. Um, I would say that the most important thing here uh, is very important to define the structure, the structural model. It's very important, in my opinion, to use symmetry properties, for example. But it's also important uh, uh, to realize that some properties are more different than others to calculate. And you can find the result in this paper in the NCC. Last part. And we have 
more or less 10 minutes. This is about NC. It's done by Shua. So what are NC? NC are bidimensional materials. Because of that, uh, they have a lot of surface. And because you, when you see a lot of surface, you have always a lot of reactivity. And you also have some weird uh, electronic properties, depends what, what is your point of view. So there you are generated by something called maxi phase, which is uh, a titanium carbide and aluminum. So there are some bidimensional layer joined together by uh, aluminum atoms. And it's possible to remove the aluminum layer in order to have some isolated metal carbon system, which is, for example, this system here. Uh, in general, they present the, the, the root of formula is something like metal to carbide, carbon. But what we were investigating here was to try to replace one third of the well, one metal, in this case, vanadium carbide, with zirconium, not doing it alone, but doing an order of substitution. So these, these are the metallic and xene, if you want. And once you do that, you can selectively remove principle, or this is easy for us on the computer, the second materials, and then basically you end up with a new scene where there are some ordered vacancies, okay? Um, this is not the whole story. So once you've done this, you can also decide to go on the surface of the material and put uh, these uh, black balls, which are basically atoms or functions, and they also can change and affect the properties of the materials. Um, I would say that the important aspect here is at this stage we're doing some theoretical prediction. Because uh, one thing is to calculate the predictive properties, another thing is to actually do them in the lab, because these systems are extremely difficult to isolate and stabilize. So <coughs> let's go into the results. Here I present one, two specific cases. The first one is the B metallic and seen with an even zirconium and carbide. Uh, you can see the bank structure. This material has a small bank gap. Uh, it's basically anti ferromagnetic because you have the same number of up and down reactions. Uh, and then basically we can predict the properties. I didn't spend much words on this, but basically when you have this separation between different spin channels, one interesting application besides catalytic application is the use of this material for spin chronic, spin valves, and other, let's say, exotic electronic applications. Okay, I won't spend much words on that, it's more technical. I just on, on this perspective, I want to point out that these properties are often related to the presence of an hexagonal uh, lattice, which is what is very popular recently because of graphene. So this material, if you want, are of interest because they somehow mimic graphene, at least in the structure. And so for that reason, Direct cone and other exotic properties are highly investigated for such purposes. So, anyway, we obtain our system. I presented here the uh, number two of the ELF, the localization factor, so we can understand how the electrons, for example, are spilled are basically at the same um, spin of the two zirconium, but I don't know if you can see that here, but basically the two vanadium in the section have different values because they have different spins. So we can somehow control the magnetic ordering, and you can see in the picture here, which is easier to, to, to spot it, you have it, uh, basically the, the spin polarization change sign when you move on the on the zirconium, but not on the vanadium. Uh, so once we have this system, the question is what happens if we deposit uh, or we bind it, if, or chemically speaking, one molecule on the surface? In principle, you expect that when you change the surface of something, the, the bulk probably do not change. They do not change because the surface is a small fraction of the whole electronic system. But when you are in a bidimensional, uh, bidimensional system, that's not true anymore because you are basically changing most of the material. And for example, when you put O2 molecules on the surface, you see that you create a dipole, you create a rearrangement of the charge in the system, and this charge can be seen very well, this charge arrangement in the band structure, because you see that now the spin up and the spin down channel is different. We end up with a semi or semi uh, half semiconductor. So you get two different band gaps between the two different spins, 
which means that, for example, you can selectively um, ex excitate only some specific uh, electron, for example, if you calculate a spin rod, if you build a spin rod. Uh, the issue, of course, is to make this system and then use them in a real device, but in this case, here you can suggest us that actually testing different circuits can change in a significant way the overall properties. Um, But what else we can do? Once we have all electronic properties, I, I, I didn't show that before and when I spoke about MOF, I showed that here. Uh, EFT, when you do molecular dynamics, can be your source of, of intervention, of speed, of forces, and you can calculate dynamics. But when you, you can also use it to calculate other parameters, you can use, for example, Monte Carlo simulation, which are some larger scale statistics. Um, and if you do that, we can also calculate the magnetization moment. You can calculate the Curie temperature if you have a ferromagnetic or the Neal temperature if you have a ferromagnetic. Mm -hmm. So, and if you do screening of tens of these materials, uh, well, maybe we can have the wrong solution, but we can suggest to experimenters which are the combination of elements that they should prefer. So they should invest more effort to stabilize rather than trying and measure everything. Um, unfortunately, these, these dependencies are not trivial, they highly depend on the compound, on the theory you use, and mostly because of these dipole effects, they are also long range and they can affect the whole system. Um, so, to con conclusion this part, uh, yeah, basically this is a proof of concept that you can actually uh, change the property, change the composition, and uh, using it in a useful way. On top of that, this is just a small remark. Uh, this paper has been published on uh, physical chemistry and chemical physics last week. And I'd like just to point that all this work, this is very important in the community of DFT and in general physician science. All the data are available. The paper is open access, pay for that. But in principle, if, if we didn't, it would be available as a preprint on archive. And uh, all the data sets are available on GitLab. And I think it's extremely crucial that people share their data, especially for us, the experimental part. Often we have no access to experimental data, or we have to trust other people. Mm -hmm. So to actually conclude, I thank my funding. This is the final talk on the fundings. Um, and I hope someone of my group take a picture for the funding agency, a part of the video, just for bureaucracy. Uh, I'm joking, they took a project and all the girls back again. So, and yes, everything done on that I can give in case you want. And uh,